Let's say somebody's listening to this as a podcast. Let's start that way. Who wants to summarize what you just saw there? That'd be a good way to do it. What were those examples? Cheese making, yes. And by the way, we've been joined by um, Liz Grenshaw as well. Liz, welcome. And she's not talking yet, but we'll see if we get her eventually. Okay. She said hi in chat. Okay. Cool. Liz, can you say hello? Uh, no, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. So somebody described a lot of Maker Fair things. Karen, why don't you describe what, what's in the video there? And that's um, building and shooting off rockets, which was a part of a summer camp out here that I was a part of. Um, a bunch of Maker Fair stuff, including cheese making and Lego for little kids programming and older kids programming and supercomputer computational projects and um, writing, national writing project, youth voices, writing novels, students writing grants um, for community service projects, building a house, my personal favorite. Was that yours? That was actually me sitting on That's top of I that beam. <laughs> And my nephew was in the second part. Um, definitely an educational experience for him in lots of ways. Um, and I don't know what else I left off, but lots of doing stuff and making stuff. Mm -hmm. and I, I was going to say, Paul, that it, a lot of those images reminded me of um, teaching, you know, young kids in a in an like sort of in a progressive elementary setting. And I don't mean that um, in a negative way. I mean that I, I think I've always felt like um, a lot could be learned from the kind of making that happens in you know progressive um, settings for younger kids with regard to you know experiential learning basically. So that would imply that that um, curriculum has to do with how we set up bells and schedules and organize kids in a building too it's not right I mean it's is not just is that a question for me you mean for anybody yeah. Oh. yeah yeah because because part of what part, part of what makes it more difficult as we go up is these structures where kids move around you know in these classes and and so forth I think it's partly that and it's partly just mindset and I think there's often an an idea, particularly as you move up the grades, that there's so much content you have to plow through that there's no time to do stuff like that. And I mean, partly what I wanted to show this video, and I sort of did, if you saw on the side of the video, those are actual correlations to some of the Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. And part of my idea was you can cover the standards and do stuff like this. I um, The one thing I didn't mention was the the kids singing. They're um, 13, 15, and 17, and that was actually at a Maker Faire. And they were so articulate and, I mean, you could tell they just have organized all this. And I watched them and I thought, this is better, you know, they're doing this in front of a big crowd. This is better than any public speech class you could ever do in high school, you know. Um, I had something to say about the making stuff. A um, little anecdote first, like, uh, you know, as my kids were growing up, I always collected their good stuff at the end of every year. So, you know, like I have extensive files on my kids, like, you know, I'm equivalent to J. Edgar Hoover or something. <laughs> I've got like tons of information on them. But I noticed as their years went on, like, like the folders got tinier and tinier. And so by the time they entered junior high, there was like nothing. I would look through their stuff through the year, at the end of the year, and I'd think like, man, there's really nothing that I want to save anymore, which was really sad. And so as a teacher, then I always think, I want them to leave with stuff that they can, you know, like bring home and mom and dad will just cry over or, you know, laugh over or treasure, you know. And um, the other thing that it made me think of was Dewey. You know, Dewey stuff all started with this practical knowledge that was rooted in kind of situation. And, you know, the longer we go on in school, it seems like we're, we're big into abstracting things, you know, but we're not too big into doing things. And uh, that's what I noticed about that segment was just all the doing, all the good doing, I guess we should say. Because we do a lot, but it's not really stuff that we want to keep in, in the upper grades, especially. 
I think one of the, the challenges is as you move to the upper grades, there's this belief that there's a certain amount of content in every subject area that every child has to get. Um, but that kind of falls apart because usually when they leave high school or if, if they go on to college, they don't remember a lot of that content anyway. So the fact that we made them take algebra and geometry and chemistry, although it theoretically may seem like a good idea, it really doesn't pan out. So I guess I continue to struggle with what type of content knowledge do kids really need? Or is it more important that we just set them up for continued learning and to really figure out for themselves what they want to look like what they want and need to learn to be successful as they move forward you know I this is not as big an idea as you guys are having so far but one of the one of the things that I was reminded of recently when I started working with a young man who struggles as a reader even though he's uh, you know 20 years old and um, he has to pass a U.S. history exam, right, um, before he can graduate from high school. Um, and so people have been working with him. He came to me. He said, I have to do an outline of American history. I said, what? You know? <laughs> so the, the point is the, the, the broadness of, of that, of, of what he was expected to learn um, interfered with him learning to read better, right? So so we, we messed around with a couple ideas. He, he started being fascinated by Abraham Lincoln. And, and um, you know, so we read an article together around Abraham Lincoln, and he started an inquiry into Lincoln, right? Which, you know, is a fascinating character. But he's not getting the broad content of that history that, you know, he's supposed to get for the test but he's learning how to read. And so I just worry that in covering all that material, uh, we're, we're not helping kids to read better. So, so he's going from a simple article about Lincoln and then he's going to a more complex article because he's learned, he's been introduced to some of the vocabulary already there, right? And so he can use that vocabulary in the more complex. So I, I just, sorry to go so long with that example, but it just seemed to me that, that we lose a lot of sort of um, skills the kids need, like reading and writing and, and being able to make things when we cover material. Liz, is that you? I, <laughs> we can I, almost I, I, do this. Go ahead, Paul. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I was just going to quickly say that I think what you're talking about, too, reminds me of conversations about um, disciplinary literacy. So... What does it mean to to uh, to understand history in the way that historians understand it? You know, um, I mean, it's not always possible, and I think I think there is this tension between you know wh what do you know what should kids know? Like um, because and and I don't know maybe maybe there's nothing that kids should know, but I think I would argue that there are some things that I think you know we can make visible to kids that they might not find on their own, but I think as much as possible, the idea that um, what we're giving kids are the tools to understand the discipline in the way that, you know, someone who is, um, you know, is, is a, an expert in that discipline would, would uh, approach, uh, you know, the content is really what we want to do. It sort of sounds like what Paul was describing a little bit, like a starting with an inquiry and following a path. Um, or it could be. And, and I, would, I would say that I think, you know, I've seen, um, like, for instance, with the example of history, um, I, I worked with a, a professor uh, at, in um, Amherst uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst who he, um, at the college level, had his students investigate, um, like, the trial of Lizzie Borden. <laughs> and the idea was that they had to determine, like, you know, their own verdict um, based on primary source materials that they uncovered from that time, um, you know, come up with this reasoned judgment of was she guilty or was she not. 
Um, but in doing so, you know, they had this opportunity to really investigate, like, well, wh what were the, you know, what was going on historically at that time, in that time period that led to, you know, um, these differences in, in wealth, you know, that was, that, that was a part of this story that, you know, sort of the untold part of this story. So just, just as an, as an example, I think, uh, it's possible to start with like small incidents in history, like you were describing with your student, but those small incidents, you know, reveal um, broader aspects of, you know, of the time period. Mm -hmm. And Monica, you, you've been a math teacher. How have you dealt with that question of, because that's a big issue in math, right? Um, how are you going to cover all the material in math? <laughs> well, I think I did it pretty well. I mean, you figure out ways to, um, to micromanage it, and that was my addiction. Um, <laughs> so the last four years I haven't, you know, I resigned from math for that very reason because it was, nobody was asking the questions. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, when, when they get engaged and there's a, a small percentage of people that really geek out on school math, I think mathematical thinking is, is addictive in a good way. Um, Mm -hmm. So I guess the way I dealt with it finally is I resigned myself from deliberately teaching it. But are there moments in these four years when you do find yourself teaching mathematical thinking? Or kids oh, learning it day. somehow? Everyday so mathematical thinking. We're talking about exponentiation factor? and fractals and um, every day. And that's that's, I think, why it became so clear to me that the only problem seems to be the compulsion of a prescribed curriculum. Um, it's not that anything's good or bad. It's just that compulsory piece when, when a, a person's not ready or not asking to know about it, you know, that it's probably not going to stick. I'd been using um, the percentage of 75% because it came from kids um, said they either cheat or cram the night before a test because they're busy too, you know, and so they're trying to get as much in as possible. And Denise Pope was just on with Steve Hargaden, and she was saying the updated percentage is, is above 90 percent. Um, and this is at the university level as well. What, so, explain that? What do you mean? The percent? That there's that many people. Her, her quote tonight was that it was above 90 percent of kids cheat. Oh. And it was more you know, when they got into it, it's more a matter of survival than it is of that they think that they're ethically cheating, you know. They, they, to the kids, most of them didn't feel that they were cheating. So um, I guess that kind of goes with what you were talking about, uh, about are we missing things like mathematical thinking and the ability to read because we're so concerned about covering things that we're going to test on because that's the visible part. That's the, the more visible part, you know, and maybe the, the less invisible is what is, is going to make us better community members, you know, like Chris is talking about. Um. Karen, are we far from your video? <laughs> well, I'm thinking as we're talking about Common Core, which I know is another topic that sends many people sort of in, in a not happy place, but I feel like you know, part part of this, a big part of this video for me was that I really think that Common Core is an opportunity to focus less on content and more on those skills. And I think, I mean, this is kind of the rest of the video, but I think that as teachers, we need to sort of seize control of the situation of curriculum and make it about what, what we think is right. Because I think every teacher will tell you right now that we're you know, where most curriculum, where curriculum is in most schools is not where they think it should be. And, and you know, I don't want to sound flip to say, you know, teachers just need to take control and do what they think is right. But, I mean, somebody needs to. And, and I feel like Common Core is an opportunity to do that. So, I know other people don't feel that way, but. Let's watch the next, next part of the video, though, um, which will be about five minutes here. <laughs> 